In this message, we share simple ways to nurture our faith, truths that undergird strong faith, and practices that help develop strong faith in God. All right, why don't we rise to our feet, please? We're going to make our declaration, and then we're going to spend some time in God's Word together. So if you brought your Bible, I'd just like you to hold it high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong together. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I love his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word and I live by his word. Christ is my master and to him I am in absolute surrender. I advance boldly to take new ground to extend God's kingdom. I have kingdom power and authority vested in me. The powers of darkness cannot hold me back. Or pin me down. The forces of the enemy. Cannot restrain me. Or contain me. The greater one. Is in me. God's power through me. Is more than what the devil can handle. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn around to people next to you. And say hello. Shake hands. God bless you. May be seated, please. Yeah, I just want to remind, kids camp is starting this week. Uh, Amy just reminded me. So our parents with children, please, uh, if you haven't registered, uh, if you want to send them to kids camp, please register right after service. And uh, we'll be happy to have your children part of the kids camp happening this week. Starting this week, it'll continue on through next week. We've been dwelling... On the subject of faith. Uh, We've been spending several weeks. This is part eight uh, of the series. This is the eighth message in this series. We've got two more to go. Uh, Amy was telling me this morning, it's a long series. (laughs) And I I responded, I said, even though we've done it 11 parts, we've only touched certain things. There's a lot more to this uh, in the word of God, which we need to be established in. but nonetheless, we will have to wrap it up. We'll, we will wrap it up in two more Sundays. Uh, but uh, I hope that, you know, over these, these weeks that we've been uh, dwelling on this whole subject of faith, that you are coming to a place uh, of understanding uh, how to walk in faith. You see, knowledge in itself, is, knowledge is important. But it, God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge so that's important but knowledge in itself will not help it is knowledge that is acted upon that brings results knowledge that is acted upon you got to use it you got to do something with that right it's got to become a personal revelation meaning it's it's something that you take in you say i'm going to live by this so knowledge acted upon will bring results okay knowledge is good but in itself uh, it's not going to produce. You've got to act upon it. You've got to live by that. And that's what we really want to move all of us into, that we act and live by these truths of, of faith. I want to quickly review um, the seventh message in this series. That is what happened two Sundays back. Uh, I just want to quickly review, and then we will uh, move forward as we build on this whole uh, subject of faith. Um, Uh, Two Sundays back, in part seven, we talked about exercising faith, but we tried to uh, put down as steps uh, on how we go about exercising faith in God. Now, we did say that uh, exercising faith is not a formula. It's not A plus B is equal C. That's not what we're trying to make this look like but it's important for us for the purposes of learning for the purpose of understanding uh, to break it down I like to break it down you know some people are stories people some people are point people 
<laughs> I am more of a point person, you know. You know, some people, they talk, they tell story after story after story. My, my question is, so what's the point? You know? <laughs> You've given me three stories. What's the point of these stories? <laughs> you know? I look for the points. I mean, you give me the truth. You give me, give me the point, I'm enough. But uh, some people like stories. That's okay. Um, uh, so here are the points. Right? These, are the, these are the points, the key insights, the truths uh, that we must, we must understand uh, in order to exercise our faith. But understand that exercising faith is not about, you know, I fulfill point one and point two and point three. It's not a formula. It's a relationship with God. It's a journey with God. Uh, but for our understanding purposes, we break it down like this. So we itemized it this way. We said, number one, have a desired goal based on God's word. So you, you have a desired goal based on the word of God. Uh, number two, you be determined to have what God has promised. That means you are setting yourself, like your face is like a flint saying, I'm going to get it. I'm going after this. Nothing is going to deter me. Nothing is going to stop me. I'm going after this no matter what. Number three, you fill your heart with the word of God because faith is birth and nurtured with the word of God. Number four, you pray, you receive by faith. Number five, you speak your faith. Number six, you act in accordance to your faith. You thank and praise God. And number eight, you stay in faith with endurance. Right? Now, we itemize it like this so that we understand this is what I need to do in order to see my faith produce in my life. And I can tell you, I can share stories around these points uh, that, that say that over and over and over again in, in my journey with God, I've seen faith work. I've seen God produce. A God, a God respond to faith. That God does respond to faith. Right? So we're not just talking theory we're talking about these things this is God's word it works now what we want to do today uh, as we keep developing uh, this subject is to talk about how do we develop strong faith how can you and I grow in our faith uh, how can we come to a place where we are so confident so bold in God uh, when we exercise faith how do we develop strong faith and I want to address that let's begin in second Thessalonians chapter 1 Verses 3 and 4. Uh, you know, in the good old days, I really loved to hear the pages of the Bible turn. It was so wonderful to see people with their Bible open. And, uh, but then came these things called PowerPoints and these phones. So nowadays nobody carries Bible. They have it on their phone, you know. And I mean, I said, I, but I still love to... Just open the Bible. There's something so special about reading from the Bible. So even though we do put things up on the PowerPoint, if you have a Bible, I encourage you to bring it. I encourage you to turn in it and flip the pages, underline it, mark it, read it. I mean, there's just something special about that. But if you still want to use an iPad or phone, that's your choice. That's okay. God loves us both. Amen. <laughs> right? Uh, so it's no condemnation. I was sitting with one, so I'm going off topic now. <laughs> I was sitting with one minister friend, and the whole conversation was, should we allow people to bring phones to service? <laughs> he was totally against reading the Bible on the phone. And he's a pastor of another church in Bangalore, right? So we are in this call. This is, the church has gone from bad to worse. <laughs> Because we are letting people bring the phone. That is so disrespectful. They must bring their Bibles and, and all of that. So I'm just listening, you know. I said, oh, no, if he came to APC, <laughs> he'd think like we're all not saved, you know. <laughs> I just kept quiet and I was listening. But anyway, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So Paul is commending these people. He says, you know, we, we want to thank God for you, because your faith is Growing exceedingly. So these people as a community, as, a, as individuals and as part of this community, their faith was growing. Their faith was increasing. 
But look at the environment in which their faith was growing. It was an environment of love. Because along with their faith growing, what was also growing? Your love towards each other also is abounding, is increasing. And what else do we see verse 4? Their faith and their endurance was also there. So in this environment of love and faith, uh, endurance, in the midst of hardships, the, Thess the Thessalonian church was going through hardships. It was birthed in hardship. Uh, so in that midst of that endurance, their faith, uh, in, in that midst of an environment of love, of endurance, faith was growing. And he says, we commend you, your faith is growing. And uh, that's the way we should be as a community, that our faith should keep on growing. What seemed like mountains yesterday, today we should stand before and say, oh, we've seen those mountains move. Amen? As a community, as a people, we can, we've seen God move mountains for us. Right? We've come to a place of greater faith in God. We can see God do greater things, more powerful things. Maybe in the early days, you know, if somebody got healed of a headache, that was a big thing. Thank God for it. It's valid. <laughs> but God, we want to see blind eyes open. We want to see cancers disappear. We want to see tumors disappear. We want to see everything that's in the Bible come alive in our services. Amen. Now that's the kind of church we need to go. That's the place where our faith has to grow. Our expectation should be that, God, we want to see those things happen. Amen? And that's, how do we get there? How do we grow our faith? So I, I, I broke this message into three sections. The first section is, I will share three simple things that nurture faith. A second section, we'll talk about uh, uh, truths that we need to be established in that undergird strong faith. It's like, these are the truths that are foundational. They undergird your faith. So we talk about that. And then in closing, the third section, we talk about practices that help develop strong faith. So let's begin. First of all, I'll talk about three things that help nurture our faith. What are three things, practices that you and I can maintain in our lives that will keep on nurturing, that will keep on feeding our faith? Number one is we need to nurture our faith with the word of God. Let's read Romans 10, 17 out. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we know this scripture. That faith is conceived. Faith is nurtured by the word of God. So how do we nurture faith? you got to stay in God's word. Stay in the word of God. You know, I, I, I may have been preaching the word of God for decades now. But I still spend almost all my time hearing the word of God. So when I'm driving, I'm listening to sermons. When I'm in the gym, I'm listening to sermons. So it's good to go to the gym. You get to hear sermons. Right? What, whenever I have that free time, I'm listening to the word of God. Why? Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. It doesn't come by having heard. Oh, I've heard it. It's not about having heard. It's about hearing the word. So you've got to constantly keep hearing the word of God. So, you know, and thank God for the tools we have. Right? We can have, we have phones, uh, we have Bluetooth, so you don't even have to have a wire going from your headphone to your, nothing, it's like hands-free. You have your, your headphones on, Bluetooth connected, you can keep hearing the word of God. Uh, so we have these tools that help us, enable us to constantly keep hearing the word. And I want to encourage you to do that because your faith is nurtured by the word of God. So you make that effort. And the word there, for the Greek word there in Romans 10, 17, for the word, word of God, is really rhema. Rhema means an uttered word, a spoken word, as opposed to a concept, as opposed to a thought or an idea. It's a spoken word. Faith comes by hearing the spoken word. So you can speak the word to yourself. 
That's rhema. You spoken word. It's an uttered word. Or you can hear the word preached to you. That's rhema. It's an uttered word. A spoken word. Faith comes by hearing the spoken word. The, the preached word. The proclaimed word. The word that is uttered. So constantly hear the word. We've taught us uh, earlier this year. We talked about meditating in the word of God. Uh, we said that you know, when you meditate in the word. There is contemplation. There is visualization. And there is confession. These are three components of biblical meditation. So when you're meditating. And you do this. And I constantly do that. Whenever I have free time, I have my Bible open, I'll just go back and meditate on various things. If you feel you need healing, then you meditate on scriptures that, that, that are concerning healing. Because that will nurture your faith for healing. If you uh, need to have faith in God for money, then go and meditate in the scriptures concerning money. Uh, if you need faith in God to, you know, to overcome uh, sins in your life, to overcome addictions, the just meditate in the word of God that tells you that you're free from sin, that you are, can overcome sin. That word will build faith in you and by faith we overcome. Right? So meditate in that word. Hear the word. Meditate in the word and live by that word. That, that, that these practices nurture our faith. Number two, we nurture our faith by being part of a community of faith. You need to belong to a community that will build your faith, not tear your faith down. Right? So you need to be, believe, you need to be a part of people who will encourage your faith. Not fill you with doubt and unbelief and tell you God retired, God lost his power. No, no, no. Be a part of a community that says God is alive, God is well, God is a miracle working God. God hears and answers prayer, God does the impossible. I mean, be such part of such a community of believers. Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, let's read it out together. Paul writes here that the sharing of your faith, are you reading it? Let's read it out. That the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now look at that verse very carefully. That the sharing of your faith, that word sharing is the Greek word koinonia, which is the New Testament word for fellowship. So when we say let's have fellowship, we are saying let's have koinonia. So he's saying here that the fellowship of your faith, that word koinonia, fellowship, may, includes the idea of community, of partnership, of sharing, of uh, doing things together, of having things in common, koinonia, that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. So there is this fellowship, this community of faith, and how can you have a community of where your faith, where your fellowship is really effective, very, very really powerful. It's producing something, that the fellowship of your faith will produce something. Sometimes we fellowship and it produces nothing. You feel like, man, I wish I didn't even go. Because it didn't produce anything. It was, it was ineffective fellowship. But he's saying that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. How will it be effective? He tells us that. What? By the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So how can we have effective, powerful, productive fellowship? Not by finding the faults that we all have. That is not effective fellowship. So you go and tell somebody, you know, I'm going through these problems, challenges. Good for you. You deserve that. <laughs> God is teaching you some mysterious lesson. That is not effective fellowship. That makes you more depressed after the fellowship than when you entered the fellowship. Then you need counseling. But what is effective fellowship? Effective fellowship is the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in you, which is in Christ. Jesus. So when you tell them, look, I have some problems. I'm going through difficulties. Then they pull out the good things that are in you because you're in Christ. They say, Yes, you're going through problems, but in Jesus, you are an overcomer. In Jesus Christ, you will God will cause you to triumph. 
in Christ Jesus, sin will not have dominion over you. What are they doing? They are acknowledging the good things that are in you because you are in Christ Jesus. And that is good fellowship. That is the fellowship of our faith that is effective. So, as we are part of a community like this, where people are calling out the good things that are in you uh, because you're in Christ. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't call sin sin. Of course, we have to address issues. Of course, we have to address wrong. Of course, we have to say, look, here are some areas that need to be changed. But in the process, we don't condemn the person, but we call out the good things that are in them because they are in Christ Jesus. We talk about how they can be victorious. We talk about what God has already made possible so that they can live victorious lives. And that kind of fellowship will nurture your faith and not tear your faith down. So be a part of such a community. Number three, last three, how do you nurture your faith? Nurture your faith with testimonies of faith. The more stories you hear about God doing wonderful things, your faith is going to be encouraged. Amen? So you need to hear testimonies of faith. The Bible tells us to keep talking about the works of the Lord. And I'll just give one example. Uh, the Psalms are full of them. Psalm 105, verse 2, it says, Sing to him, sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Talk about the things of God. Talk about his wondrous works. Talk about the things that God has done. The miracles he's done. Talk about his wondrous works. Amen? So that will build our faith. As we hear stories of it. Look at what God did there. Look at what God did there. Look at what God did there. It will encourage our faith. Amen? And last year I was in Calcutta. And uh, we, we were in a, in a certain in a Baptist mission home, we were there the conference was being there. During break time, I was sitting. I was just sitting in that room. We all had a little room, so I was sitting in my room, and uh, some people came to visit. They were from the AG Church in Calcutta. Uh, they just came. They just wanted to talk. So they just came. We had a few minutes. They were sitting and talking, and we started talking. Then, in the few minutes, they just shared the testimony of. Uh, I forget the person's name. Uh, the missionary, the AG missionary, the pastor came first, like, you know, almost 50 years ago. He, ah, oh, Mark Bunting, thank you. They shared the testimony of, of Pastor Mark Bunting, who had come, it was one of the early, he started the AG church in Calcutta. And they were just sharing the stories and, and what had happened, and what's going on, and how many thousands of people, they, they, had a, they have a feeding program, they have, a Christ, they have a Christian schools, they have the uh, assemblies, they have several assemblies in Calcutta. And they were just talking about this amazing legacy that he had left behind. And now he was a new generation of uh, uh, pastors who were carrying on the work. And they just shared all their stories. We prayed and left. And I closed the door and I just sat down I said, God. What an amazing testimony. And when I just said that, the presence of God just overwhelmed me. I was crying. I was crying. What had happened? Somebody, they didn't know what happened. They left. But they had testified about the wondrous works of God. And it just opened up the presence of God. And I was just literally sitting with tears in my eyes, overwhelmed by the presence of God, simply because somebody had shared a story of what God did through Pastor Mark Bunting, who's gone on to be with the Lord. But it was so overwhelming. You never know what your stories of faith can do for somebody else. Amen. It can just change their lives. It can bless them. It can bring the presence of God into their lives and, and cause some amazing things to happen. So nurture your faith with such testimonies. You know, that just encouraged me. I said, God, if you could use a man like Mark, Mark Buntain to uh, impact Calcutta, God, you can use me. You can use us as a church to impact the city of Bangalore and impact the nation of India. Do it again, Lord. As simple as that. Amen. Just multiply it a hundred times. So, nurture your faith this way. Now, 
there are truths that undergird strong faith. If you and I want to be people of strong, bold, confident, dominating faith in God, you and I must be established in certain truths in the word of God. We need to be established in these truths. And that's why as a church, we keep reiterating these truths. Pastor, why do you repeat some messages over and over again? Because we don't get it the first time we hear it. So we have to repeat and repeat and repeat. Just say the same thing in different language. And some way we will get it. Because we need to be established in these truths. Number one, what are these truths that undergird strong faith? Number one, you and I need to be established in the integrity of God's word. That you and I know, John 17, 17. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. We must be established in that. The word of God is indisputable. It is God's word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will stand forever. That you and I say, God, this is your word. It is truth. Uh, doesn't matter what my circumstances say. Doesn't matter what people say. Doesn't matter what doctors say. Doesn't matter what, uh, you know, whatever people say. God's word is truth. God's word is final authority in my life. I'm living by this. If I have to die, I'll die by the word. I'd rather die believing the word than die doubting the word. We're all going to die anyway, so. <laughs> Might as well die believing the word. Because God's word is truth. So we need to come to that place as believers. We'll be established in the absolute integrity and authenticity, the finality of God's word. Because that will undergird your faith. Number two. Be established in, the fin in Christ's finished work on the cross. You and I need to understand the cross. Understand what Jesus did on the cross. He's not just some savior uh, dying there, bleeding there, and you feel sorry for him. Being sorry for Jesus dying on the cross will do you no good. But you need to have a revelation of what he did on the cross. That's what's important. Know that on the cross, he removed sin. He destroyed the power of sin. He broke the power of Satan. He removed the curse. He triumphed over principalities and powers. He did it so that you and I could walk with authority and dominion over Satan and his demons. Know what Christ did on the cross. Be established in that truth. See, even the Bible, the Bible says, even the devils fear and tremble. Some of us have no fear, no trembling. The devils fear and tremble. Amen. Now we got to be established in the cross. This is the cross. Oh, this is what Jesus did in the cross. Everything Adam brought us under through the fall, Christ delivered us through the cross. Everything. Or you can say it like this. The cross is God's complete antidote for the fall. Complete, not partial. It's God's complete antidote for the fall. We need to be established in that truth. Because out of that truth, we have strong faith. Number three, be established in our identity in Christ. You need to know who you are in Jesus Christ. Are you all with me so far? I know it's hot in the summertime, but hey... It's hotter in other parts of India. <laughs> be encouraged. <laughs> we need to be established in our identity in Christ. We know, uh, it, the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are a new creation. Your identity is changed. Who you are has changed in the spirit. And you and I have to live out of this new creation that we are in Christ. And we say this often, who we are in Christ is who we really are. That's your true identity. And so you live out of your identity in Christ. When you face circumstances, situations, always face them based on your identity in Jesus Christ. Be established in that. Number four, be established in the reality of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Know the power of the Holy Spirit. He's working through you. He is working in you. He's working through you. There is no power greater than the power of God's Spirit through you. That's why John wrote, greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. 
The greater one is in you. The Holy Spirit. And Jesus put it like this in John 7 verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So out of your innermost being as flowing rivers of living water. God, out of my innermost being, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is flowing to touch people, to minister to people. So you need to have confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit in you, working through you. Be established in that. And last one in this section. Number five, be established in the authority of the name of Jesus. Jesus said this in Mark 16, 17 and 18. These signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. They will drink any deadly thing. They will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So those who believe will use his name. So you have a right to use the name. You have a right to speak that name. You have a right to, uh, to use that name. And I say, when we, the Bible says use that name, it's talking about delegated authority. The authority that's in that name has been delegated to you. It says, go use my name, in my name. And we need to understand what it means to use the name of Jesus. First of all, understand what is the authority that's in that name. And what does it mean when you and I say in Jesus' name? When you stand next to a sick person and say in Jesus' name be healed. What is that? What does that mean? When you're praying in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. What does that mean? It's not a cue for other people to say, now it's time to say amen. That's not why you say in Jesus' name. That's not the point. What does it mean? It means you're actually exercising, exercising delegated authority. You're exercising your power of attorney. You're exercising that. When you say in Jesus' name, it means you are standing there in his place on his behalf to do what he would do if he himself were there. That's what it means. Amen? Amen? So you expect things to happen when you pray, when you speak in that name. But we need to understand, be established in this. So being established in these truths are very important because they undergird our faith. Now last section here. Practices that develop strong faith. I'll, I'll go to this quickly. What are, what are the practices? How do you develop strong faith? You know, for those of us who go to the gym... When you go to the gym, every time you go to the gym, you do the same exercises over and over again. You can't say, last month I did it. Doesn't count. Hey, you're doing bench press, sit-ups. You can't say, yesterday, three days ago I did bench press. So again today. And I remember when I was in college, I was training for athletics. It was tough. Three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. First, you run five kilometers. That's only warm up. <laughs> After running five kilometers, our coach would take us, you know, uh, those days he'd take us into uh, Chinnaswami Stadium, up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs. We're doing this every day. I can't tell him, coach, I did it twice yesterday. Yesterday doesn't count. Today, up and down. Then go back to the continuous stadium, go to the gym. Same set of exercises. Upper body, lower body, legs. Same set. After you've done all of that, run back home. Five kilometers. And you do this every day. Every day. Why? That's how you build capacity. That's how you strengthen those physical bodies. So that's how you strengthen, build capacity. Do this exercise, same exercise, same routines, same number of times, over, over again, every day, five days a week. And morning and evening. Now, how much more for our spirit? If you want to build capacity in your inner man, in your spirit man, how much more? So what are those practices? Number one, always declare God's word. You can't say, yesterday I said it. 
Yesterday doesn't count. What you say now. What you say now. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope or faith. That word, Greek word can be translated anticipation, expectation, faith. So let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. Because he who promised is faithful. So you are confessing your faith in his promise and he's saying hold on to your confession of your faith in his promise because the one who promised is faithful. That means every time you are going to declare the words. Every situation declare the word. You're not denying what the problem is by saying yeah I recognize there's a problem but here's what the word of God says about the problem. So you declare the word. And he says hold fast to it. You can't say I did it yesterday. No. Now. Hold fast to it. Your faith in his promise because he who promised is faithful. Number two, the second practice. Always maintain a clear conscience. You see, faith cannot work without a clear conscience. What do you mean by a clear conscience? It means it's a heart that doesn't condemn you. That you're not walking in guilt, shame, and condemnation. Most people, most believers have weak faith because they have a conscience that is condemning them. They have something that says, you know, you're not fit. You're not good. God is not happy about you. Uh, you're not up to the mark. And so something inside them condemns them. And the, John writes there in 1 John 3, 21. Beloved, if our heart condemns us, then we don't have confidence before God. But if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him. Because we do what is pleasing in his so have to maintain a clear conscience, meaning be free from guilt, shame, condemnation. How do you do that? Number one is when you sin, when you and I sin, if you, if you and I sin, immediately confess to the God. God, I messed up. Sorry, forgive me. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me. Done. Second, embrace your standing in God. Embrace the fact that you are righteous in God. So I am righteous in God. Don't let anything change that. The enemy, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. So he comes with accusations. You're not fit. You're not this. No. He's trying to rob you of that clear conscience. Boom. And third, do what is pleasing in the sight. Live a life that's right before God. So you maintain that clear conscience. Because when you keep a clear conscience, you're bold. Anytime you can step out in faith. You don't feel like I'm condemned. If your heart is condemning you, you cannot be confident towards God. You can't have confident faith. So maintain a clear conscience. Number three, always exercise your Faith. So faith is like a muscle, we said in the beginning. The more you exercise it, the more it's going to grow. Start from where you are and begin. Use your faith for things in your life right now. Circumstances in your life. Use your faith. Exercise your faith. In every situation, have a faith response. Think, speak, and act in faith. See, as a pastor or as, a, as, a, as a, generally in life, you and I will be called into situations where things are hopeless. Maybe sometimes you're called to a sick person. Sometimes you're called to a person who's in addiction. Sometimes you're called to a person who's, who's messed up financially. Very difficult. And, and these things look hopeless. What should your response be? Oh, dear brother, I'm really sorry. No, you, I'm so sad. Sorry that you're in such a shape. You know, hope God does something for you. No. You can't afford to speak like that. You have to speak the way Jesus spoke. What would Jesus say if he was there? He would only say, fear not, believe. Amen? That's what Jesus would say. His response will always be a response of faith. And so you and I must practice responding in faith. Think, speak, and act in faith, in line with the word of God. In every situation, there's nothing too hopeless for God. And last one, always be motivated by love. Always be motivated by love. Galatians 5, 6, Paul writes, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Faith works through love. In other words, if there is no love, faith can't work. It's like, Break down. Broken down. Can't work. So you first got to be motivated by love. God, what would love do for this person? What would love do in this situation? Be motivated by love. Because when you're motivated by love, faith can follow. Faith works through love. Always be motivated by love. Because it's that 
channel, if you will, through which faith works. If there is no love, faith can't work. Faith works through love. So be motivated. Ask yourself, God, what, what would love do for this person? What would love do for him or her in this situation? And then you stretch out, exercise faith. Amen? So, if you've survived the sermon. <laughs> First, we saw three things that nurture faith. We saw in order to nurture faith, stay full of the word of God. Be a community. Uh, be part of a community of faith. And share stories of God's workings. Then we talked about how do we, truths that undergird strong faith. What are the truths you and I need to be established in that will undergird strong faith? You know, be established in the integrity of God's word. Be established in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Uh, be established in the authority of Jesus' name. Be established in your identity in Christ. Be established in the power of the Holy Spirit through you. Be firmly convinced about those things. And lastly, we said practices that develop strong faith. Always speak the word. Always respond in faith. Keep a clear conscience and always be motivated by love. Amen? This will help you and be you and I be people of strong faith. We'll have a community of people of strong faith in God. Amen? Let's close, please. Father, just thank you for your word. Thank you for your working in our lives. Thank you for the things you do for us. And I pray that the word that has been preached will bear much fruit in each of our lives. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Have a good Sunday. Thankful of all the people sitting outside in the heat. God bless you. Have a good Sunday. See you again. God bless. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.